Welcome to Delighting in the Trinity with Michael Reeves, brought to you by Union. This podcast brings you teaching and preaching from our archives, and you can find more resources, audio, video, and books at unionpublishing.org. Chapter 5 Esteem Friendship Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Ecclesiastes 4, verses 9 to 12. Today, we're all swimming downstream from Thomas Carlyle. Thomas Carlyle, that great 19th century historian and polymath, is famous for his great men of history theory. Here's how he explained it. Universal history, the history of what man has accomplished in this world, is at bottom the history of the great men who have worked here. They were the leaders of men, these great ones, the modelers, patterns, and in a wide sense, creators of whatsoever the general mass of men contrived to do or to attain. In all epochs of the world's history, we shall find the great man to have been the indispensable savior of his epoch, the lightning without which the fuel never would have burned. The history of the world, I said already, was the biography of great men. In other words, as Carlyle saw it, history is steered and shaped by. In fact, history is Caesar, Charlemagne, Napoleon, Washington. Our thoughts are shaped by great men, Plato, Newton, Nietzsche, Darwin, Marx. And as Christians, the way we look at church history and historical theology can feed that. We sometimes approach these topics as a survey of theological and pastoral greats. Athanasius, Augustine, Aquinas, Luther, Calvin, Edwards. And make no mistake, I really want to spend time with those men. And if you're a good student of church history, you certainly will. But there is also a danger in this approach. Namely, that we would gather the impression that the growth of the church is all about great men. And it's not just in studying history that this is a temptation. The church itself can become a great men culture. Think of the appeal of the big name in conferences. Think of all those names on the backs of the books we buy. Think of whose circles you want to be in and whose name you want to cite. He was my teacher or I shared a meal with him once. Think of how we use big names to win an argument, to support our own point of view. I'm not suggesting that this is all wrong. There is something right about having leaders we trust. But for young would-be leaders going into church ministry, there is a danger in this hierarchical, focus-on-the-individual kind of thinking. It can distort your ambitions. After all, you rightfully want to be fruitful. And if that's how God works through great men then you will also want to be a great man. It's not just that your gospel vision can skew into a desire for personal greatness. The great men theory can set you on a course to being a lone ranger, a hero, a splendid solitary oak tree, marvelous in its aloneness, something to be admired from afar. But one of the greatest practical problems I see across the church is the isolation of so many church leaders. There are many contributing factors, but surely one of them is the idea that spiritual growth occurs only or mainly through the purposeful influential actions of elevated individuals. Please let me be clear, I don't want to downplay the genius of many great men. Throughout church history, and even in the biblical narratives, it has often been an exceptional man raised up by God who has provided the special leadership or reform the church has needed. Surely we see that in a Luther, a Lloyd-Jones, a Stott, and others. But even when the church 
has had one of those great men. These men have never been alone. In fact, it is precisely when they are alone that the problems occur. Indeed, all through church history, collegiality has ever been central to times of spiritual blessing. For instance, in theology, think of the galaxy of friends around Augustine, Luther, Calvin. In mission, our minds can quickly leap to a missionary hero like William Carey, but we fail to remember the circle of friends around him. Andrew Fuller, John Sutcliffe, Samuel Pierce, and John Ryland. Or take Billy Graham. Just as Carey would never have been Carey without those friends, so Billy Graham would not have been the Billy Graham we know without Cliff Barrows, George Beverly Shea, the Wilsons, and Leighton Ford. I think of how John Stott loved to go away on writing breaks here in Wales with Dick Lucas and Richard Buse, and of how he would deliberately nurture others in turn. Yes, again and again in church history, we see that it is a band of brothers who gather together around a shared vision. They're not merely acquaintances or colleagues, they're friends and they encourage and push each other on. Thank you for listening to Delighting in the Trinity. If this podcast has encouraged you and you would like to stay in touch with the ministry of Michael Reeves, then we would love to invite you to become a friend of Union. On signing up, you'll receive a free book from Union Publishing. Then you'll receive regular exclusive devotional material from us. You'll also have the chance to keep up with the latest news and updates from the ministry of Michael Reeves around the world. If you would like to become a friend of Union today, follow the link in the podcast description now. Thank you so much. And sometimes in these bands of brothers, we recognise that there was no leading great man at all. Think of the Puritans. In a sense, yes, there were many great men among the Puritans, many well-positioned to shape and raise new leaders, but it wasn't a movement built around one man. It was a movement and fellowship that grew out of a broadly shared vision. C.S. Lewis said in The Four Loves that where lovers look into each other's eyes, friends stand side by side and look ahead to their common interest. This imagery brings to mind the seraphim in Isaiah's vision, crying, holy, 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 to one another, Isaiah 6, verse 3. This is why we started Reformation Fellowship, to gather friends around a shared passion. Now, it's actually slightly unusual to talk about friendship like this in Christian circles. We talk about networks. We talk about fellowship. But those can be quite relationally hollow or chilly phrases. To network can be just to use a contact to get something done or to make a superficial connection now that we hope might pay off in some way later. Fellowship is often nothing more than Christians drinking coffee together. Or sometimes we truly do fellowship in Christ, working together for the sake of the gospel. We should aim higher. Psalm 133 sings of how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. Verse 1. It is like oil running down the beard of the high priest at his ordination or like the dew that rolls down the mountains of Zion, making the land fruitful, verses 2 to 3. Appropriately, in his high priestly prayer in John 17, Jesus prayed to his Father that they may be one, even as we are one, verse 22. For as the oil ran down from Aaron's head to his body, so the Spirit runs down from Christ our head to His body, the Church. Our oneness is a Spirit-wrought reflection on earth of a heavenly beauty. Warm and hearty friendship is the highest form of fellowship. 
It is an anticipation of what fellowship will be like in heaven. It is partnership, allying together in warm, rich, personal appreciation. This sort of fellowship testifies to a friendly, personal God and an eternal hope where all the fellowship involves true and holy delight. I mentioned C.S. Lewis' The Four Loves. I wonder if you've read it. If you haven't, you've got a treat to enjoy sometime. His chapter on friendship is a favourite of mine. It is an insight-packed paean to friendship. Interestingly, one of the first points Lewis makes is that institutions often dislike and distrust friendship. Its leaders very often do. Headmasters and headmistresses and heads of religious communities, colonels and ship's captains, can feel uneasy when close and strong friendships arise between their subjects. But there's no need to distrust it, for a friendship is not the same thing as an exclusive coterie or cabal. True friendship, says Lewis, is the least jealous of loves. Two friends delight to be joined by a third, and three by a fourth, if only the newcomer is qualified to become a real friend. The foundation for friendship, Lewis says, is companionship, which is what we often mean by the term fellowship. He writes, I prefer to call it companionship or clubbableness. Companionship entails a basic willingness to get on and work well with others. Companionship is a necessary starting point, but that's still not quite friendship. Friendship, Lewis adds, arises out of mere companionship when two or more of the companions discover that they have in common some insight or interest. That is why those pathetic people who simply want friends can never make any. The very condition of having friends is that we should want something else besides friends. Where I only want a friend, no friendship can arise. In other words, it takes the shared interest to create the friendship. The one enables the other. Then, Lewis goes on to see what this friendship is that shared interest has created. And he argues that friends are not just allies. They're not just useful when the times are tough. Friend means more than that. Friendship is unnecessary, like philosophy, like art, like the universe itself, for God did not need to create. It has no survival value. Rather, it is one of those things which give value to survival. That is, friendship is not a means to an end, but an end, a value in itself, something which enriches our humanity. So, what has happened is that the common quest or vision which unites the friends has not absorbed them in such a way that they remain ignorant or oblivious of one another. Through their common vision, they become blessed with an affection for each other. You see this, for example, in the friendship of John Newton and William Cooper. They found their friendship in their shared desire to produce hymns for the church. But... That shared quest brought something more. Here were two quite broken men, Newton with a painful past, Cooper with his depression, supporting each other personally, protecting each other, and bringing the best out of each other. And here, Lewis, on what it's like to be in such a friendship circle. In a perfect friendship, this appreciative love is, I think, often so great, so firmly based, that each member of the circle feels in his secret heart, humbled before all the rest. Sometimes he wonders what he's doing there among his betters. He's lucky beyond desert to be in such company. Especially when the whole group is together, each bringing out all that is best, wisest or funniest on all the others, those are the golden sessions, when four or five of us after a hard day's walking have come to our inn, when our slippers are on, our feet spread out toward the blaze, and our drinks at our elbows, when the whole world, and something beyond the world, opens itself to our minds as we talk, 
and no one has any claim on or any responsibility for another, but all are free men and equals as if we'd first met an hour ago, while at the same time an affection mellowed by the years enfolds us. Life, natural life, has no better gift to give. Who could have deserved it? That's the wonder of friendship. It opens our eyes to know each other and so to appreciate them as themselves. We see behind their role and their potential usefulness. We see them and begin to sympathize with their weaknesses and esteem them for their qualities. It is for us in our friendships as it was for Christiana and her party in the Pilgrim's Progress. They seemed to be a terror one to the other, for that they could not see that glory each one on herself, which they could see in each other. Now, therefore, they began to esteem each other better than themselves. For you are fairer than I am, said one, and you are more comely than I am, said another. This isn't politeness or flattery. Friendship opens our eyes to the qualities and beauties in our friends. At the end of the first chapter of his letter to the Philippians, Paul wrote a passionate plea. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that, whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Philippians 1.27 Notice his logic. Living worthy of the gospel of Christ must include with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. When the Son of Man is lifted up, he draws people together to himself. See John 12, 32. A culture of individual isolation and lone rangers is not a culture of the gospel. The gospel creates a taste of heaven that is fruitful on earth, an anticipation of that day in heaven when, like the seraphim, we cry to each other in affectionate, shared adoration. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. You've been listening to Delighting in the Trinity with Michael Reeves, brought to you by Union. Union is devoted to growing leaders and growing churches. Our School of Theology equips leaders for ministry. Union Publishing supplies them and their churches with quality theological resources and books. Union Mission supports and financially helps church planting and revitalization. And Newton House, Oxford, invests in the next generation of theologians and scholars. Our vision is to see leaders and their churches the world over reformed and renewed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. To find out about our courses and learning communities around the world, to buy union books, to discover support for your church plant, or to become a friend of union and support our ministry, visit www.theola.gy